when I was first raising issues around Demi, I didn't know really much about it, about it. But more and more people contacted me, and this is people across the world. When I realised that this was a, a bigger issue than I'd probably first appreciated. And at that point, it was when a constituent raised the PACE trial that I thought, oh, this, the, there really is something here. So um, I'm going to look at this in a bit more detail. The issues surrounding what's happening to children, um, particularly some children with severe ME, are really very distressing and issues that the parents have had to face as well with accusations of um, FII and similar been been levelled at them is quite upsetting. But I've got to say probably the thing that, that bothers me most is that people with ME are just utterly ignored, that they're left on their own to just, you know, exist uh, in the hope that nothing else happens or that, that nobody has to worry about them. And I think it's that level of neglect that I've found most disturbing about what people with ME are having to deal with. I think the disability of ME is one which doubly disadvantages people. On the one hand, it's an invisible disability. On the other hand, it's a denied disability. We as members of this house can give people who often don't get heard a voice against what can be a very powerful medical community. We all know that medics have got it wrong in the past. This is something that if we don't get this right, then the consequences, particularly for paediatric ME sufferers, can be absolutely disastrous. Now, as we know, ME is a chronic multi-system disease that impacts approximately a quarter of a million people across the UK. Now, to put that number into context, ME affects more people than the terrible Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis combined. And it is estimated, as already been mentioned this afternoon, it has an economic cost of 3.3 billion. Now, one would imagine that these considerations alone are sufficient to ensure adequate funding for biomedical research into ME and clinical care for those suffering from the disease. And yet, ME research represents just 0.02% of all active grants given by UK mainstream funding agencies. It really does beg a belief that research into an affliction that leaves a quarter of sufferers house or bed bound and from which 95% of people do not recover receives so little funding. When I was a young human bioscience undergraduate, Madam Deputy Speaker, studying immunology, um, I heard this referred to in the labs as multiple excuses, and that wasn't that long ago. Um, and so there is clear evidence that much more work is needed on the biomedical and the biological processes uh, behind this um, complex and devastating uh, disease. We're all aware of its fluctuating and sometimes invisible symptoms, which have fueled an unjust and debilitating stigma around the disease. And this stigma is institutionalised into the fabric of ME medical research, healthcare provision and our welfare system. ME is an illness which has probably been around for as long as many other illnesses that we know about, um, but it probably really only started being noticed anecdotally after the, the Russian flu of the late 19th century, and then perhaps more particularly the Spanish flu of 1918-1919. But the first properly documented outbreak of an ME-like illness uh, came in 1934 at the Los Angeles County Hospital in California in the United States. From then on, there are many, many other uh, outbreaks of an ME-like illness in many different countries. A percentage of people suffering from these illnesses had really long-term lingering consequences. So, for example, there are still some people that are sick from the Akureyri outbreak in northern Iceland that happened 70 years ago now. In 1955, there was an outbreak uh, in the Royal Free Hospital in the nurses' quarters, where a bunch of nurses all got sick at the same time. Now, that was really sort of apparently infectious, and it was considered uh, to be a neurological presenting illness. I understand. I was the... 234th victim, so it was fairly late on in the 
epidemic. They had been very certain that it had been a polio-like thing and there were residual problems because they had found that the people who had gone back on duty, quite a number were relapsing. In 1956 in The Lancet, um, uh, the name benign mild myelitis was suggested. A researcher had noticed that there were several outbreaks of apparently viral illness that for some percentage of people had lingering consequences. And he noticed that there was a pattern of where they found abnormalities in spinal cord fluid and brain ganglia. And he thought that it wasn't quite the same as polio. So he called it benign myalgic encephalomyelitis, meaning it was not fatal. Myalgic encephalomyelitis essentially means um, inflammation in the central nervous system associated with pain. Um, and the reason that they thought there was inflammation in the central nervous system was a small number of cerebral spinal fluid or autopsy studies. They found evidence of increased cells, uh, which we assume to be immune cells, um, uh, and inflammation in ganglia. So that was part of the reason that they wanted to use the name encephalomyelitis. Scientists in the U.S. were studying infectious outbreaks from around the world and seeing a similar clinical picture a picture that includes easy fatigability, weakness, headaches, cognitive impairment, prolonged ability, and a greater prevalence of females. In 1959, two scientists from the U.S. National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention published a peer-reviewed paper summarizing these 23 outbreaks that occurred between the years 1934 and 1958. The outbreaks in the U.S. in the 1980s, now referred to as MECFS, showed a similar clinical picture. And as NIH's Dr. Anthony Fauci noted in 2020, some long COVID patients are experiencing an illness that's remarkably similar to MECFS. I think it's important to know before 2005, before next generation sequencing, um, even in acute uh, meningitis, an actual causal organism was only discovered about 30% of the time. Um, so it's really difficult to learn what infection is causing a problem in the nervous system if you don't already know what you're looking for. Even if you know what you're looking for, it's still really difficult because it, the, the organism doesn't necessarily move into the peripheral blood it doesn't even necessarily move into the cerebral spinal fluid. So back in 1955, there was almost nothing they could do to figure out what was the cause. Um, and this, of course, uh, allows some people to say, well, there probably wasn't a cause then, or the, the, the cause was actually psychological or psychogenic. The, a term like encephalomyelitis now um, you know, makes people think of like meningitis or encephalopathy or things like that, which are often fatal. And I think that's part of the reason that the name has been sort of confusing for a lot of medical practitioners is um, they're not thinking in terms of sort of like a lower level, um, a lower level or chronic inflammation, which seems to be more likely the case in, in these cases. Research has demonstrated that a number of patients can develop prolonged illness following an infection. A 2006 Australian study found that an estimated 9% of patients continued to show prolonged illness following both viral and non-viral infections. And more recent studies, including both those with SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, have found that an estimated 10% or more of patients continue to be ill after the infection. We don't know why this is happening yet, but research has suggested a number of possible explanations. Some of these include an abnormal immune response to the infection, a persistent infection, autoimmunity triggered by the infection, and widespread neuroinflammation. But even when the preceding infection is proven, as in the case of long COVID, some believe that the continued debility of the disease is the result of behavioral or psychological factors. ME is an illness which has been highly susceptible to politicisation and also exploitation in many different countries, including particularly the United Kingdom, mostly because of its disputed pathology and a largely disempowered patient community. That's probably all 
really centered around the epi epidemic in North London in 1956 called Royal Free Disease, where the Royal Free Hospital was shut down by this epidemic. And it was written up by the physicians at the time. And that's when the term ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis, was first coined. And it was accepted in British medicine and Western medicine and the world health as a genuine physical illness. In 1970, two psychiatrists, McEvity and Beard, decided to re-examine the Royal Free outbreak uh, they didn't see any patients, but they got hold of the documents uh, uh, with permission and reviewed them. And they came up with the conclusion that, in fact, this was simply an outbreak of mass hysteria. The reason that they said it was mass hysteria was that most of them were women, and that's because the Royal Free discriminated in favour of female medical students. And that, that unfortunately started the fashion for disbelief in this condition. These were two researchers that really spent their career um, sort of focused on the idea that women were particularly prone to medical hysteria. Um, and unfortunately, that sort of view of uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis has permeated uh, the field. There's a long history, a shameful history in psychiatry of dismissing minorities as almost subhuman and also women. Uh, and the history of MECFS in particular is rooted in this notion of mass hysteria. So rather than there being an infection or a virus or a physical dysfunction, that what's really going on are women misunderstanding their physical symptoms and telling each other that they're all sick. And the male psychiatry profession defaulting to that explanation because it, that's how they see the world. The naked sexism is not as apparent, but the underpinning comes from the same source because it's been there in psychiatry for, for decades, if not centuries. And uh, we see it in all sorts of forms. We see it in Freudian psychoanalysis and we see it in, in, in cognitive therapies. We keep coming back to this as a society that um, women are somehow abnormal and that um, um, victims are there to be blamed, you know, that people create their own problems. That is why we don't have to deal with them as a society. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a defense mechanism that we default to as human beings, because ultimately we don't want to tackle big problems. In the 1970s, we also began to get the rise of what's known as the psychosocial model of illness. And this coincided with the aftermath of the McEverdy and Beard paper. And all of this began to lead towards a different view of illness generally, um, but also of ME in particular. And during the 1980s, gradually, there were a group of young psychiatrists, trainee psychiatrists, trainees in psychological medicine, who began to take an interest in ME as an illness. And seized the opportunity to develop their own understanding about the illness and how it should be diagnosed and treated. And this became one of the pillars of their developing careers, which then continued on for the next few decades. By this stage, uh, we are moving towards what I term the psychiatric plus fatigue model of illness, um, as opposed to the biomedical model of a well-defined ME, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, which um, may not have been exactly the right term, but described very well the symptoms that many patients were experiencing and continue to do so to this day. In 1984-85 in Nevada, in Incline Village, uh, there was another apparent outbreak um, and, and one nearby. The Center for Disease Control in the United States went in to investigate, but they didn't really interview patients. They only looked at medical records and they didn't want to sort of associate it with the previous outbreaks that had been named myalgic encephalomyelitis. Some concern about tourism in Incline Village and things like that and sort of didn't focus on it. The U.S. outbreaks in the 1980s brought national attention to this disease. The treating doctors suspected a connection to Epstein-Barr virus or some other infection. 
Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, did a cursory two-week chart review and took a few lab tests, but didn't find anything specific. To discourage assumptions about the nature of the disease, CDC coined the name chronic fatigue syndrome and in 1988 established new criteria that focused on chronic fatigue and a few specific signs and symptoms. But then within a few years, two much broader criteria were adopted. UK's Oxford CFS criteria and CDC's Fukuda CFS criteria. Each of these only specifically required medically unexplained chronic fatigue. Unfortunately, these criteria are so nonspecific that they can include other conditions, including mental health disorders. The addition of fatigue changed everything completely. And the name chronic fatigue syndrome was then imported into many other countries, uh, including the United Kingdom in the late 1980s. And the problem with fatigue is it's not a specific symptom of, the, of any illness. It's a feature of, of a whole lot of different conditions. But fatigue is a perfectly normal, healthy response to any given fatiguing situation in life. There's a real problem with people really understanding what this illness is about. And in part, I think the reason is because fatigue is so common. One out of four people has fatigue any particular day. So most people who have fatigue say, well, I have it and I get on with my work. Why can't they work? Why are they complaining? So there's a major disconnect between such a common symptom of fatigue and the symptoms of individuals with this debilitating serious illness. And that is a chasm that needs to be breached. ME is not about fatigue. It is not a, a direct symptom of the illness, although there are many, many different sets of criteria for ME and fatigue does appear in quite a lot of them. It is not a helpful one. And in my own experience, it's not an appropriate one, but also in my own experience, particularly early on in the illness, it is very difficult to describe the way that you feel and saying that you feel exhausted, very tired, that kind of language is the only language that is available. So, of course, it has become subsumed into the culture of ME as an illness and how to describe it, adding fatigue and making it, in many cases, a prime symptom of diagnosis has the effect of widening, massively widening, and diluting the patient cohort of people with some kind of similar looking illness. So the notion of ME as a discrete illness in its own right began in the 1980s to disappear, or probably more accurately, to be disappeared. Ever since Melvin Ramsey described it in 1956, there has been an ebb and flow of points of view in the understanding and explanation for ME. And basically, there are two diametrically opposed points of view. The first, to which I belong, is that ME is primarily a physical organic, biological illness, which can affect anyone. And the second is that it doesn't really exist and is purely a psychological phenomenon. The latter view explains every case of ME as being due to abnormal illness beliefs on the part of the patient, combined with deconditioning. I personally believe this completely fails to explain the vast majority of cases of ME, particularly the severe cases, if it had been true, then nearly every case in the world would have been able to be cured by graded exercise therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. In the US, by the late 1980s to the mid 1990s, key staff at NIH and CDC had adopted a psychological view of ME. NIH's Dr. Stephen Strauss described ME as subjective and noted patients often presented with histories of unachievable ambition, poor coping skills, and somatic complaints. He referred to CFS as an entity of dubious validity and endorsed the psychosocial model for the disease. And in 1996, CDC's program lead, Dr. William Reeves, stated that what had occurred in the U.S. outbreaks in Incline Village was hysteria. 
the major milestone in 2002 was the Chief Medical Officer's report uh, that when Sir Liam Donaldson uh, launched the report at a press conference, he said, we must accept that ME is a genuine illness and that patients should not be dismissed as malingerers. So we all heaved a sigh of relief and thought that that was it once and for all. The trouble with that is that um, people on both sides of the fence still weren't quite happy. The psychiatrists refused to sign up to it because it, they objected to the report stressing the organic nature of ME. And the some of the patient charities uh, saw the problem that the CMO's report did endorse graded exercise therapy and uh, cognitive behavioural therapy. Exactly the same thing happened. NICE guidelines in 2007 endorsed graded exercise and cognitive behavioural therapy, although they stressed it should only be on the basis of informed consent by the patients. The view that ME is a psychological disease was firmly rejected by the U.S. Institute of Medicine, which published a report on this disease in 2015. That report included an extensive review of the evidence of biological impairment, and it also established new criteria for clinical use requiring post-exertional malaise. Shortly after this, CDC adopted these new criteria and replaced recommendations for cognitive behavioral therapy and graded exercise therapy with pacing in order to manage post-exertional malaise. And yet, the view that psychological and behavioral problems are driving the prolonged ability of this disease has continued. As a result, patients are experiencing disbelief from their doctors. Tragically, we're seeing the same thing unfold with long COVID patients who are not only experiencing similar symptoms, but are experiencing similar dismissal from their doctors. Professor Anthony Komarov at Harvard University, a world expert on MECFS, explains that a large literature now describes multiple biological abnormalities in MECFS. These abnormalities, he says, all converge on and can affect the brain. Firstly, there are anatomic, physiologic and electrical abnormalities in the brain. Secondly, various elements of the immune system are chronically activated and in some people those elements are exhausted. This includes neuroinflammation and also evidence of autoimmunity. Thirdly, there is evidence of impaired energy metabolism. Fourthly, the autonomic nervous system is dysregulated, one consequence of which appears to be impaired blood flow to the brain. Fifthly, there are characteristic abnormalities of the gut microbiome. Naming the illness is a major problem. There are a number of different names that have been coined over the decades relating to ME. Um, ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, post-viral fatigue syndrome, systemic exertion intolerance disease, and, and others. One of the problems with the shifting names um, and the multiple outbreaks and, you know, even, even broader now where um, there are some people who've been given the diagnostic label with even without an apparently immediately infectious onset um, is that it's now become a symptom-based syndrome diagnosis. So it's practically speaking functions as a, a diagnosis of exclusion. So what this means is that a lot of people who share uh, sort of overlapping symptoms and there's symptoms that sort of overlap with most illnesses um, are going to get this diagnostic label. And, and so you end up with a situation where the patients have possibly a lot of different problems. Th that is really one of the main problems in this illness um, is that it's really hard to sort of get a, a very tight phenotyping in studies. Over the years, about 20 different case criteria have been used to diagnose CFS and ME. All of the ME criteria require post-exertional malaise, or PEM, a worsening of the patient's symptoms and functioning following even small amounts of exertion. But it's important to note that none of the CFS criteria require post-exertional malaise. Instead, they focus on medically unexplained chronic fatigue. And as a result, they can include patients who don't have ME at all, 
but instead have a number of other conditions that cause fatigue, including mental health disorders. The case definition that's used internationally was developed primarily at the Centers for Disease Control um, in 1994. It's called the Fukuda Criteria. The problem with this case definition is the classic symptoms of post-exertional malaise, memory and concentration problems, unrefreshing sleep, don't even have to be an individual and you can still be diagnosed. You only have to have four out of eight symptoms and these three cardinal ones don't have to be selected. You can actually end up with the person being diagnosed with this illness who doesn't have the classic symptoms that we think of as having ME. The consequence of this type of diagnostic unreliability and instability is like a deck of cards. The foundation is weak, then everything that's built on top of that could collapse. It's vulnerable. So that if you don't know what a person has the illness or doesn't have the illness, then what do we know about biological markers? What do we know about treatment? What do we know about anything if you have different samples that, be, that are being investigated in different labs. All science is based on having the same types of individuals so that we can make statements about their biology and statements about the different ways they react to treatments. So it's critically important to figure out who has this illness. It's particularly important with ME because ME can be very much like other types of conditions. They can have some of the overlapping symptoms. For example, Chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, is often very similar to some of the symptoms of major depressive disorder. So it's very critical to differentiate major depressive disorder from ME-CFS. And if you don't do that, you're going to start mixing some of those people with major depressive disorder into this category that we think of as ME. As nonspecific as Fukuda is, the UK's 1991 Oxford criteria are even broader. They only specifically require medically unexplained chronic fatigue that affects mental and physical function. And they explicitly allow both anxiety and depression to conditions that can be associated with fatigue. In 2016, two reports commissioned by the US federal government called for Oxford to be retired because it could include patients who had other conditions and not ME at all. And yet Oxford has been used extensively to study treatments for ME-CFS. It's important to assess the applicability of the findings from those studies to patients who meet criteria for ME. The use of nonspecific criteria and the view that the ongoing debility is the result of deconditioning and a fear of activity has had a significant impact on both research and clinical care. Clinically, this has stigmatized the disease and resulted in patients not being believed by the doctors. In research, the stigma has made it very difficult to attract researchers to the field, while the nonspecific criteria have made it difficult to compare across research studies. And these research problems have been exacerbated globally by a lack of funding for research. In the U.S., NIH funding for this disease is just a very small fraction of that provided for diseases of similar or even lesser prevalence and disease burden. My hope is that um, the topic of long COVID will benefit uh, patients with ME uh, and with CFS. Um, and so the concern, of course, is that People are going to replicate the mistakes that have been made before just with long COVID. We're going to, they're going to be really focused on coping strategies and things like that um, instead of doing serious biomedical research into how viruses can uh, hijack uh, host metabolism and cause dysbiosis and uh, you know, cause problems in nerves and things like that. So resources is really the key um, to getting researchers uh, to stay involved in the field. Because if there's not a lot of funding to do the research, it just doesn't make any sense to work on the topic because you literally can't pay your rent. In my experience, biomedical researchers are very interested in the topic of ME uh, and in CFS. Um, you know, I'm sort of lucky where I'm surrounded by a lot of really good researchers. But many researchers have had a difficult time 
Francis Ma spoke at the Royal Society of Medicine in 2015, saying, It was when a small group of psychiatrists from the UK, Europe and the USA purloined ME and renamed it CFS in the mid-1980s that the real problems began. They insisted that it was a psychosocial behavioural problem that could readily be overcome with a course of cognitive behavioural therapy and graded exercise. From their earliest beginnings, they managed to attract the attention of the media and of their medical colleagues with their assertions. They found their way onto government advisory committees and research organisations, onto the boards of medical publications and into insurance companies. Now, I have mentioned the psychiatric lobby, and I think it would be a good idea to explain what I mean by that. Um, Obviously, a group of psychiatrists or practitioners of psychological medicine, and they are their supporters, and often those will be um, people practicing different kinds of behavioural treatments, and they have constructed themselves into a lobby. And they have been lobbying on their own behalf as controllers of the illness, ME, or as they mostly prefer to call it, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, There is good evidence of their lobbying to government. And we see that in various places, but particularly in the so-called secret files. The secret files are two files which were tucked away in the National Archives at Kew. I decided to apply using the Freedom of Information Act to get the files opened up. There are still some redactions in the files, but they are essentially now available to everybody. Particularly in the DWP file or the DSS file, there is a lot of correspondence, notes of meetings, um, a lot of it between various members of the so-called psychiatric lobby and their efforts to lobby government. And in many cases, after a few false starts, these were in fact really quite successful. And this relates to a period in the 1980s and the 1990s. And there you have discussions between Simon Wesley and Mansell Aylward talking about the Department of Social Security's approaches to CFS. That then led to a meeting between Wesley and a government minister for Social Security, the minutes of which are also available in the UK National Archive and describe Simon Wesley informing people that, in the case of CFS, benefits can often make patients worse. That's a kind of approach towards patients that a government looking to try to cut the cost of disability benefits is going to be enthusiastic about. With the rise of New Labour, you then saw a cross-party consensus on the need to institute reforms that would cut the costs of disability benefits and also a desire to promote those reforms as an enabling and empowering intervention for sick and disabled people to help them re-engage with society and make the most of their lives. We also saw a rise in media stories promoting the view that people suffering from chronic health problems would be able to recover if they adopted appropriate cognitions and behaviours. And that seemed to tail very neatly with the message that the government was promoting. Along with concerns about fraudulent disability benefit claims, this all combined to encourage greater public support for government reforms which greatly tightened uh, eligibility criteria for disability benefits led to the sort of problems that we saw around ATOS and their biopsychosocial assessments and eventually led to the UN Committee for the Rights of Disabled People to declare that UK government policies constitute a grave and systematic violation of the rights of disabled people. John Pring quotes Professor Tom Shakespeare et al. from their paper Blaming the Victim All Over Again Waddle and Aylward's Biopsychosocial Model of Disability. Key to the BPS model, say the three authors, is the idea that it is the negative attitudes of many ESA recipients that prevent them from working rather than their impairment or health condition, essentially branding many benefit claimants as scroungers. 
This allows supporters of BPS, including a string of Labour and Conservative government ministers, to draw a distinction between real incapacity benefit claimants with long-term health conditions and fake benefit claimants with short-term illness, with the model responsible for a barely concealed element of victim blaming. This distinction drives media coverage and popular attitudes to disabled people by creating the supposed distinction between the deserving and the undeserving poor. So the psychiatric lobby, they are way of depicting the illness is, yes, it probably may well have started with a viral illness, a viral infection of, of some description, we don't necessarily know what, which in many cases is true. But after that point, with rehabilitation or graded exercise and some cognitive behavioural therapy to address one's false illness beliefs, then patients should be able to recover and if they don't recover then it's their own fault. Uh, patients have been described as malingering, as um, too lazy and who deliberately opt out by succumbing to simple symptoms that we all feel but because of laziness, because of a disregard for others, they claim to be sicker than they actually are. Um, this concept of malingering is a is, is an insidious concept because people who are genuinely ill are often too debilitated to defend themselves. So every illness, of course, has psychological and social factors. Um, but what has happened in this illness is there is a, a group of researchers who are well-funded um, and have a lot of influence that have sort of focused on that. And of course, if that is uh, some of the best funded, most influential aspects of a research program. Um, those are the sorts of things that are going to get a lot of press. It's a lot easier to sort of argue that it's psychological if you can't find uh, a, a similar biological problem in every single patient. So the idea that some illnesses are all in the mind, uh, it's a common cultural trope. And it's been reinforced by decades of cliche media representation. And for MECFS, it's problematic in, in two ways. One is that there has been much vilification of patients and of people whose illnesses can't easily be explained. And a lot of this has been little more than sexism. Secondly, uh, those figures in clinical practice who wish to promote psychological therapies for MECFS have actively engaged with professional media companies to publish statements and to place articles in the press to defend what is essentially very weak research against legitimate criticism and to blame patients for being unruly and unappreciative. So much of this commentary has bled out into popular culture through the media and some of it with deliberate intent. So this psychiatric lobby became increasingly powerful, really in the absence of any kind of robust response. There were plenty of response, plenty of efforts, but really nothing robust enough to deal with um, a rising and successful group of psychiatrists and their supporters. They effectively eventually seized control of the ME narrative and retained it ever since. And this has led to the setting of research insofar as there is any, which is really not very much other than what is privately funded. In 2007, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, produced a guideline for CFSME recommending graded exercise therapy and cognitive behaviour therapy based on limited evidence, claiming these were the interventions for which there is the clearest research evidence of benefit. Around the same time, the protocol for the PACE trial was published. The PACE trial cost £5 million and remains the largest and most expensive ME-CFS research project ever undertaken. It was clear that it was expected to provide evidence in support of the NICE guidelines endorsement of GET and CBT. 
It's interesting that, in, in fact, I raised this in Parliament during the first case um, trial debate, that this trial, the PACE trial, was unusual, that it was partly funded by the DWP. And I think that, that raises lots of questions about, about the trial and really the, the reason purpose behind it. Um, it's easy if you can write somebody off as um, capable or consider someone capable who is actually struggling. Um, you can save yourself an awful lot of money in terms of um, paying out on social security and benefits. So, um, so it's quite. I, I have I have real concerns about the link between the, the PACE trial, its impact on the ME community and how it's been used for some people um, whenever they try and access benefits. So the PACE trial is clearly a trial that the proponents of psychological therapies uh, turn to and cite again and again. And it's often described as having demonstrated that patients recovered, not just improved, but recovered uh, from MECFS as a result of cognitive behavior therapy and GUT. But when the data set was reanalyzed independently by independent researchers who had nothing to do with the trial, it was discovered that the finding was not as clear cut as originally reported. And in fact, because of statistical, I suppose, decisions made by the research team originally, the published findings were greatly inflated. And the reanalysis showed that the improvements seen were little more than random changes from pretense to post-tense. The treatment groups did no better than the control groups. And the PACE trial did not actually demonstrate that CBT and GBT were beneficial at all. And the bottom line is that this trial just doesn't come up to the basic standards that we require for uh, reliable evidence, certainly not in clinical pharmacology. Uh, they've used an unblinded approach with subjective endpoints, and that is just too uh, um, open to bias uh, from subjectivity. In fact, the situation is an awful lot worse than it is in almost any other situation because the, the treatments, uh, CBT and GET, deliberately encourage patients to say they are better. And so the fact that they say they are better really tells us nothing at all. Grave concerns about the quality of the PACE trial and its results were raised by independent researchers and patients. Data from the trial was held by Queen Mary University of London. In 2016, following a protracted process during which Queen Mary spent nearly £250,000 on legal fees in resisting release of the data, an information rights tribunal ordered Queen Mary to release some of the trial data to Alan Mathies, the patient who had requested it. Researchers then subjected the data to independent analysis. Many of the proponents of psychological treatments for MECFS are themselves heavily invested in long careers promoting cognitive behaviour therapy and psychological treatments for a variety of conditions. And we know that in science and in research, a conflict of interest can arise where people have an allegiance to a particular therapeutic approach. We call this therapeutic allegiance. Uh, and it's worth remembering that the PACE trial and these studies around the PACE trial and similar to the PACE trial have never been replicated by independent researchers. They all tend to be conducted by the same community of like-minded and mutually collaborative uh, research teams. In fact, when independent researchers do get involved, the effect is most commonly to debunk the original study. There was a lot of people reacting against the PACE study. So um, another friend, Janelle Wiley and I, volunteered to put all their ideas together in a detailed analysis of what was wrong. And we tried to get in touch with the editor of The Lancet. We tried to get in touch with one of the authors of the PACE trial and they just ignored us. So then we tried journalists, MPs, you name it. We had a long list of people to try, both here and in America. They all ignored us. 
what really shocked me more than anything, not that the pace trial was so bad. I mean, that was a big shock. Make, make no mistake, it was so bad, it really shocked me. But the fact that we couldn't get anybody interested. And you think, you've got a quarter of a million people ill with this disease. You've got five million pounds on, on this enormous study, and it's so bad, and you're not interested. For many years, patients have requested a review of the 2007 NICE guideline. The recommended treatments of GET and CBT were causing patients to deteriorate. The underlying cognitive behavioural model of MECFS was clearly wrong. Finally, in 2020, when NICE reassessed the evidence for GET and CBT, the evidence from the PACE trial, which had been widely misrepresented by the authors and by the media, was graded as very low or low quality. After long delays and a last-minute hiatus caused by some royal colleges who refused to accept the work done by NICE, the revised guideline has been published in October 2021. Instead of recommending the incremental increases in activity of GET and associated CBT, NICE now advises do not offer people with ME-CFS any therapy based on physical activity or exercise as a cure for ME-CFS. Physical activity or exercise programmes that are based on deconditioning and exercise avoidance theories as perpetuating ME-CFS. The NICE website highlights the importance of ensuring that people remain within their energy limits when undertaking activity of any kind. But unfortunately, there is no medical advice about how to help people whose health deteriorated severely when they followed the previous recommendations. It's not just medical support that is often lacking. And many people struggle to access welfare support, benefits, disability living allowance. There's also issues amongst with people with ME accessing private health insurance that will write them off as not actually having, having anything wrong with them. In the US, it's been exceedingly difficult to get disability benefits for this disease. A few years ago, the Social Security Administration, the federal agency that covers disability benefits for most Americans, reported that only 13,000 Americans were getting disability benefits from ECFS. That's really remarkable when you consider that 1 to 2.5 million Americans have MECFS, and of them, about 75% are unable to work. It's also very difficult to get coverage for doctor's visits, tests, and treatments. Because of the complexity of the disease, doctors often have long visits with patients. But at least in the U.S., insurance companies typically don't reimburse for the amount of time doctors actually spend. And insurance companies often will not pay for important tests and treatments because they view them as experimental because of the lack of research. So the, the benefit system, especially since 2008, has been based on what's been called what they call a biopsychosocial model of disability, the way that ME has been portrayed and this biopsychosocial model that was informing the welfare reforms were very interconnected the work capability assessment deliberately seems to be um, eliminating issues of, of fatigue and pain and post-exertional malaise that people with ME have. Assessors aren't even allowed to assess people with ME for cognitive, mental or intellectual uh, function. One of the biggest barriers that people with ME face to work is that you have multiple problems across cognitive, physical function, sensory problems and very often people are scored no points at all or put in the so-called work-related activity group because the system doesn't allow for to score for the cumulative impact of multiple or generalised impairment. There is no objective biomarker or scan that can show the level of impairment that people have. It's purely reliant on people's subjective reports and people's own reports of their symptoms are discredited because under the cognitive behavioural model we have supposedly have irrational fears and flawed beliefs and therefore we're seen as not credible witnesses. Often people with severe ME have disengaged from the medical system completely because they've been faced with disbelief, denial, 
or harmful treatments that have made them worse or they're housebound and, and their GP just won't come out and see them. So you very often have the most severely affected people who are completely off the radar of the healthcare system and can't call on a GP to provide medical evidence. There are possibly even more problems with the social care system in terms of ME than with the benefit system. So ME, as we know from the, the research on health-related quality of life, um, scores at the lowest of all chronic health conditions for quality of life and kind of functional loss. And in the survey that I did with Action for ME, over 90% reported levels of difficulty in day-to-day -day life and need for support that were indicated by the CARE Act that they possibly qualified under the CARE Act for social care support. And yet only 6% of peak respondents to our survey had a social care package. There's so much misinformation about ME, what we could call the cognitive behavioural model of ME. That's causing ME to be seen as a, at best as a lightweight disease, or even worse, as a disease that's almost self-inflicted. And the idea that you would actually provide care and support to somebody could be seen as, well, you know, if, if it's caused by fear and activity avoidance, surely providing a care package is going gonna, is gonna to perpetuate that disability as opposed to alleviate it. So you've got that very fundamental problem that we have this um, misinformation about ME in the healthcare system. So the impact of being disbelieved is personally very devastating and very damaging and undermining to people's mental health, no matter who you are. Now, people with ME-CFS already have a very distressing illness. So to patronise them or to ridicule them or to disbelieve them, either directly in a clinical setting or through the media, is, is especially cruel. Most patients with ME-CFS are far too debilitated to engage in any kind of campaigning or any kind of public criticism of their doctors or of researchers. This is the ironic thing. I mean, this idea of us being activists. Activists, we take hours to produce a little bit of writing. Um, I mean, Alan Mathias, who pushed PACE to release its data, um, he is now incredibly ill. He is in very serious state, bedbound. Bob's health deteriorated a lot after all this work on PACE. A lot of the people in the group, their health... I can't say their health suffered because of it, because obviously you can't prove that, but a lot of them, their health has deteriorated since, because it takes a lot of energy to do this sort of thing. It's very easy to ignore a group of people that are hidden away, that are so ill that they can't actually advocate, um, that they can't raise issues for themselves. So it's very easy to forget that this group of people exist. And I think there are many people that have relied on the, the difficulties that people with ME have in interacting um, or because of their illness that have allowed them to be ignored. And I don't think that's good enough. You shouldn't need a patient to say, I need a change to this. And it shouldn't need patients to be, raise it. it. Health professionals themselves should be accepting that there is an issue that has to be dealt with and has to be tackled. Some of the problems with medical education about MECFS are deep-rooted and long-standing in that most doctors don't know what MECFS is and 40% of doctors don't actually believe it's a real condition. So there's a huge gap in the knowledge and there's a lot of work to be done to re-educate re from undergraduate and postgraduate levels about this disease. Even the major textbooks in uh, adult medicine and paediatrics have a chapter referring, of course, to the term chronic fatigue syndrome. And these chapters are nearly always written by psychiatrists the average medical student receives very little positive training on ME or explanation that it is an organic process. And similarly, postgraduate education is exceedingly patchy. More than half of medical schools are not really teaching this topic. And when they are, they're teaching it alongside medically unexplained disease or functional illness. 
And so many medical students don't really understand what MECFS is. We did a recent poll of 100 students and a third didn't even recognise the disease MECFS. But there is a pressing need to include MECFS because it is so widely misunderstood at all levels. And there may be an increased patient population due to long COVID patients developing MECFS over the next few years. It's not just about educating medical students. Students are in school for a relatively short period of time, but doctors are in practice for decades, treating patients. So it's even more essential that doctors who are already in practice are educated about ME. When we looked at a small survey of GPs, the only GPs who knew most about the condition were those who actually knew a person with MECFS outside work. And some of the confident GPs actually scored quite badly on the knowledge front. They were very confident at telling the patient that it was all in their heads. We need the major medical associations to encourage their members to learn about ME. To date, that hasn't happened. The tsunami of long COVID patients, some of whom may develop ME, create an urgent demand to get the attention of medical associations as quickly as possible. So very often um, I speak to participants and I'm no longer surprised to hear that there's a breakdown in the relationship with the GP or with a hospital consultant because of um, disbelief in the illness itself. More often than not in my clinic, I have encountered patients with ME who have been written off by healthcare providers as having no real disease or certainly something that the healthcare provider could not help them with. We have found some distinct abnormalities in ME, uh, CFS, that appear to be very, very different from uh, findings with this type of invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing uh, to those seen in simple deconditioning or detraining. On the venous side, we see low filling pressures, whereas in deconditioning, what has been described is higher filling pressures. Uh, and what we're seeing on the arterial side is a significant abnormality of systemic oxygen extraction, which is not a feature of deconditioning. When we see evidence of preload failure, or subsequently when we see hard evidence that there is arterial vascular dysregulation during exercise, and when we do a skin biopsy in these patients and we find evidence of a small fiber neuropathy and we say, there is no way this abnormality is in your head, they will break down and cry because they've been rejected by so many for so long. One of the most distressing aspects of ME is the severe end of the spectrum, and both children and adults with severe ME, who are housebound and bedbound, are quite frequently subject not just to disbelief, but also neglect by the medical profession. Many uh, GPs nowadays refuse to do home visits. Uh, a lot of consultants in hospitals refuse to do domiciliary visits. And so I've seen severely affected patients who haven't seen a doctor for five years because of they're too ill to attend the hospital outpatients or the GP surgery. And yet these patients are the most deserving of support, sympathy, symptomatic treatment. Uh, and it's really a very distressing area. There's huge numbers of patients and they're often not seen for years by doctors and they're some of the sickest people in, in the community. And it puts a great burden on family members who are, tend to spend years just in an unpaid carer role. If a child is not diagnosed with ME and is quite severe, then the other professionals involved, the school, the psychological services, in their disbelief, can take alternative views of the family and can even uh, accuse the mother of fabricating the illness or exaggerating the illness. And th these proceedings often 
result in the family being threatened with safeguarding proceedings and having case conferences. I personally have been involved in 60 or 70 families who've been officially subjected to case conferences for safeguarding purposes. Fortunately, very few of them actually end up with a child being re removed, but the underlying stress and uh, stigma attached to these proceedings is very damaging for families. And in the case of adults, there is sometimes a risk of forced admission to a psychiatric institution and then the patient being subjected to inappropriate regimes as an inpatient in a psychiatric hospital. And sometimes the results of those admissions can be fatal. problems with treating this as a biopsychosocial disease is that doctors aren't looking for objective measurements of what they could do to help improve the patient's symptoms. For example, many patients with ME-CFS have orthostatic hypotension or postural tachycardia syndrome, and yet doctors aren't measuring for that change in heart rate and blood pressure on standing. There are a number of steps that doctors can take to decrease the symptom burden and increase the patient's quality of life. This includes non-pharmacological therapies such as pacing and expansion of fluids. It also includes a variety of pharmacological therapies to address symptoms. The doctor can also diagnose and treat any comorbidities that may be worsening the patient's symptoms, and they can help the patient address support services and disability benefits. The primary care doctor could take many of these steps and refer to a specialist as needed, but this often has not happened. I think one of the reasons that the medical profession as a whole have been reluctant to fully accept responsibility for ME as an organic illness is the increased specialization in medicine. Uh, increasingly, every physician, even in a district general hospital, has a special interest, and the same happens with paediatricians, and there hasn't been an ology created for ME, and this has led to increasingly specialized doctors abdicating responsibility for ME and that is a cause of great uh, concern for the patient community. What is really demanded of all of us is that we develop over time a system by which the silos are broken down, where specialties and subspecialties are all talking to each other. And what ultimately I think should happen, and we've begun to do this at Harvard uh, as a new part of a new initiative, is to develop a center, an ME-CFS center, which mimics other diseases, where a patient could be seen by pulmonary, critical care, uh, primary care, neurology, rheumatology, immunology, uh, and everyone is talking to each other. And there are case conferences where patients are discussed and their data are reviewed. My dream to build at, Har at Harvard Medical School in Massachusetts General Hospital is to create a, a sort of a pipeline where people with this diagnosis um, can get multiple forms of really cutting edge testing, importantly to see if we've missed anything because a, a lot of these patients with this diagnosis, unfortunately the difficult complex truth is probably that there are some people where there's just something that's been missed. There are patients that have been sick for decades and have never even had a brain scan. So we don't even know if there's some structural problem like a Chiari malformation or cranial cervical junction problems or something like that. We don't even know because they've never even had a brain scan. The situation is grave. There are individuals who have the most significant medical problems and they are being treated poorly for the most part. Many individuals have given up. Many individuals have basically felt that their healthcare system, their governments have abandoned them. 
These are individuals who are stigmatized, alienated. They've had the trauma of an illness and then the trauma of the healthcare system and often family members as well as coworkers who don't get it because there's so much stigma against this illness. We have to change this. People need to stop denigrating ME and dismissing it as something that just makes people a little bit tired. People die with and of ME. I am sick of attending funerals and inquests into people who have died because of ME. And it is time that this illness was given the respect it needs and money put into research. We will look back with hindsight on what's being done to particularly to young people with ME with absolute horror because it is abuse. I do think that the neglect and lack of belief and lack of proper research had allowed harm to continue for a long time. By not dealing with this properly and by not addressing it, we have caused extreme harm to many thousands of people over many, many decades. And unless we get this right and unless we make changes, we're going to continue causing the same abuse to many people. The NICE Guideline 2021 states... Recognise that people with ME-CFS may have experienced prejudice and disbelief and could feel stigmatised by people, including family, friends, health and social care professionals and teachers, who do not understand their illness. Take into account the impact this may have on a child, young person or adult with ME-CFS. That people with ME-CFS may have lost trust in health and social care services and be hesitant about involving them. The final draft version of this guideline acknowledges that there is no test, no treatment and no cure for ME. Now that is a shocking admission for an illness which has been with us for nearly a hundred years. One of the things that most concerns me is the self-perpetuating nature of bad science, especially the way vulnerable members of society are left by the wayside in order to preserve reputations and status of influential clinicians and cliques. But over the years, today, much bad science happens precisely because of power structure within science and within academia, where power structures seek to preserve themselves and people put themselves beyond criticism and authority is used as a tool rather than something that needs to be avoided. It's not the patients who are engaging in faulty reasoning here. The biopsychosocial theory of MECFS is essentially a grand delusion, kind of a sanctimonious shared belief shared by a professional clique who for little more than circumstantial reasons find themselves dominant in British, especially behavioral medicine. One can only conclude that human attachments to ideas learned in youth are hard to shake. Physicist Max Planck once said that scientific ideas are changed not by acceptance of rational evidence, but by the passing of generations. Many mental health professionals trained in the 1980s and earlier will continue to feel allegiance to the BPS model, no matter how outdated it becomes. Those in coming generations will forget about it. In the UK, we have a number of high-profile cases which have become well-established examples of systemic injustice. Windrush, thalidomide, the infected blood products, Hillsborough, Stephen Lawrence, and all of these cases have become accepted as examples of massive institutional failure. My argument is that the treatment of ME patients is in a broadly similar category to all of those examples. However, ME predates all of those cases. Millions of ME patients have died over many years and are continuing to die without proper recognition or treatment. And therefore, that definitely amounts to a case of fundamental systemic injustice and potentially institutional abuse, given the length of time that it has carried on. Of course, the politics of health is complex and nuanced, and there are many, many competing interests. But ME has been at the bottom of that pile of interests 
for many, many decades, and it's time that changed. The mistakes of the last 50 years are now having an impact on people developing chronic ME-CFS-like illness following even mild COVID-19. It's extraordinary how many long COVID people have a post-viral syndrome that's strikingly similar to myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. This is a public health catastrophe that could potentially involve a large segment of the population. ME-CFS and long COVID patients don't have time for science to do its incremental stumble, for dogma about disease to gradually shift, for academia's gatekeeping mechanisms to slowly buckle. They need a transformative, patient-centred approach to research, now. Now. 